If you're in that fearful moment, visualize, vocalize, vote vicinity. That will get you flowing with positivity to move to where you want to go. Those four Bs took me to victory. Those four Bs can take you to victory. You need to be visualizing where you want to go. You need to vocalize to yourself you are good enough. You have to vote positively every single day, and you have to change who you are around. If you don't like who you are around, change it. A lot of times in life, when things happen, you're fearful or the unknown, you got to count on yourself first, right? People aren't going to help you unless you want to help yourself. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Flow Over Fear podcast, where it is our mission to help you to rise above fear and realize your ultimate potential in leadership and life. I'm your host, Adam Hill, and it is my goal to share with you the human side of high performance. My guests share their experience with fear, anxiety, struggle, challenge, and most importantly, despite all of it, how they rose above it to achieve incredible results. So if you're ready to rise up, let's get started. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Flow Over Fear. I'm super excited you're here today. I have a great guest. Marcus Ogden is a former NFL player who is now an inspirational keynote speaker. He's the founder and CEO of Ogden Ventures, LLC, a three-time best-selling author whose books include Sleepless Nights, The Success Cycle. Uh, he's a business coach and, and uh, consultant and the host of a top 1% global podcast, Get Authentic with Marquez Ogden. His powerful story of overcoming adversity to rising back to the top as a thought leader has been featured in top publications such as USA Today, Forbes, Cheddar News, and Authority Magazine. He has graced the stages of Fortune 100 and 500 companies and has interviewed iconic guests such as Michael Strahan, Joe Namath, and Willie Parker Jr. And through his speaking, coaching, and podcast, he hopes to continue to make a positive impact on as many people's lives as possible. And he's doing just that. Thank you so much for being here, Marcus. It's good to see you. How are you? Thanks for having me on, my friend. Oh, it's uh, it's it's a pleasure. The pleasure's all mine, and and you've got an incredible story. I've really been thrilled to dig into y- your story, and and I know I, I there's so many directions we can take this, but I really want to start kind of at the beginning because you you um, I know that you grew up in a single parent household, and your father was a big influence on you. Can you kind of dive into how it started for you? Yeah, so we grew up in Washington, D.C., Northeast. Uh, our dad raised us a single dad. My parents divorced when I was eight. My brother was 14. My brother, Jonathan Ogden, is the Ravens' first draft pick ever, first battle Hall of Famer, 12-year career with the Baltimore Ravens. We had a really great childhood uh, with our dad. I mean, our dad was very successful, uh, did well financially. But unfortunately, when my dad got to be right around his early 40s and I was going into the middle school, high school, he kind of went through all his money uh, in that uh, in that regard. And so as a result, he ended up putting himself in a position where he was not able to sustain. And as a result of that, he ended up spending all this money. So when I got to high school for St. John's College High School, thank goodness my grandmother and my great aunt paid for my high school and I was able to get a full scholarship to go play for Harvard University and the Bison and that was amazing and it was just fantastic and really what happened from there is education was always first I wanted to actually go and work on Wall Street uh, as an investment banker follow my dad's footsteps but I ended up getting drafted to the National Football League I'm actually the first and I'm still the only offensive lineman ever drafted from Howard University to the National Football League by the Jacksonville Jaguars. I'll be actually going this year to the Jaguars 49ers game for the Jaguars Legends Weekend. I'm excited to see a bunch of old teammates, great fans, uh, go back to Duval County and see a lot of great faces. But then from there, you know, I got played at NFL for having a nice almost six-year career. But then after that, I had some really bad struggles. And uh, yeah, life after the NFL for a few months, almost about a year was not really fun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I, I like how your how your uh, backup career was the NFL after becoming a, a stockbroker on Wall Street. That's uh that's impressive. So good but uh, it's a, incredible that you went to the NFL and and I I I think you know going back to you know knowing what you know now I know you um you know you and 
want to kind of get into the challenges you faced after leaving the NFL. But is there any advice that you would give anybody that's going into that career, you know, just starting out? Yeah, if you go into the National Football League, understand it is a business. Now, I think they're paying guys, if you make the practice squads a quarter million dollars a year, mm -hmm. if you make the active rosters, we're going to think it's $750 a year. And it's great. And, I, and now I found out that a good friend of mine, Roman Oban, who played in the NFL, who played for the Giants, uh, the Browns, actually won the Super Bowl with the Bucks under Chucky and uh, Brad Johnson, his quarterback. Mm -hmm. uh, he's told me that the NFL now is paying guys for 36 weeks, which I think is great. I think it goes from the start of the season until like April, right before the draft. And I think that's phenomenal because then guys can space out their money, you know, all kind of cool stuff. So in reality, what's really interesting is that, you know, if you're going to the National Football League, understand this. It is a business, mm -hmm. okay? It is a business. And if you're not going to treat it as a business, you risk you you run the risk of saying, oh, it's a, it's a game, it's a sport, da, 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 it's fun. And it is all that, yeah. but it's a business, right? How do you make money? How do you build a brand? How do you, you know, I mean, and tell you what, man, if, if you're playing college football, right? If you're, I mean, like, Deion Sanders and Shador Sanders, like these guys are wearing, you know, I saw, you know, I, was, I saw this on social media. They're wearing like $50,000 Rolex watches on their wrist, right? Because again, because of nil and because of the way it's set up now, it's a business, right? Mm -hmm. I didn't even think about people targeting players and cause targeting because they don't really have what they have, which is really sad, but it does make sense. And it's sad that you want to target a kid or try to hurt a kid because they're doing well financially. But that's just, you know, it's a business now. There's yeah. nil. There is money to be made. I mean, I think they said where, um, I think it's uh, Manning's brothers making more money backing up in Texas than I think Aaron Rodgers is going to make <laughs> this year. Something stupid like that, wow. right? So again, the main thing, right, Adam? Treat football, college now, and the NFL just for what it is. Yeah, it's a business. That's that's a, that's amazing, and I, I, it's 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 incredible. It blows my mind to think like right as you exit high school and get drafted, or uh, you get a scholarship to college, all of a sudden you're mixed into creating this brand and this this you know and all of this stuff for yourself, and you may not know that. And I think for for many of us who who haven't been in the NFL and just, you know, watch it and spectate it. There's this, there's, there's this stigma maybe that exists that, Oh, once you make it, you make it, you know, into the NFL, you're, you're there, you, you, but, but I, you know, we keep hearing stories about people who've been in the NFL and then, you know, they have challenges afterwards after they transition. Can you talk a little bit about that transition period? Yeah, I mean, I just saw yesterday where Stetson Benson, who was the, I'm sorry, the quarterback from Georgia, who's now with the Rams, he's not on the Rams roster. Mm -hmm. They didn't get into what it was, but they're they're alleging it is some things off the field. And I saw, I read some articles, and I hope he's doing okay, and I have grace for him because it's hard. You know, he's a Georgia legend, and then he goes to the NFL, and you're having to adjust. And he's a good player, but he's not the legend he once was at Georgia. So I don't know how he really did, you know, adapting to that. But yeah. what I'll say is this, right? It's really important that you understand that the transition after the game is real, mm -hmm. right? And so what you should be doing is getting mentorship, the NFL now has done a great job with having access to the NFL legends and NFL PA, former players association, NFL trust, NFL alumni. Like there's tons of resources out there for guys to go and get as long as you're willing to take the advice. So if you're listening to this and you're looking to play a sport, football, whatever, and you want to transition after the game, which we all do. I mean, look, shit, look at Tom Brady. Everybody say, oh, Aaron Rodgers is down. Call Brady. Why would Tom Brady leave a awesome $375 million contract to go and, and, and go out there and get his head knocked off when it comes to, you know, playing, you know, in the, the game? I, I wouldn't, yeah. right? Tom is a smart guy. He's like, man, it's time to move on. So again, if you're going to need to transition anything in life, get mentorship, get guidance, get people that you know that can help you know, push you the right way, steer you the right way. And that's why I'm really excited for Shador and Shiloh Sanders under Dad Dion. He's played the game at the highest level. You know, he was a defensive player of the year, Super Bowl champion. I mean, so he knows what it's going to be like for his sons. You know, the great mm -hmm. times, the hard times, the ups, the downs. And so, again, 
that's why I feel those boys are doing so well. They've got great guidance from their dad. So if you're listening to this and you want to transition successfully, sports, business, from one career to the next, from, from career to retirement, whatever the case may be, get mentorship, get coaching, get guidance. Yeah. And I, I feel like that's true for anything too. just, you know, even outside of the NFL, just getting that mentorship and, and guidance. And, and I'm actually excited. I'm really excited to see what the Colorado can deem, can, the Colorado team can do under Deion Sanders is guidance because, you know, it hasn't been great for a long time. So they got yeah. a big game coming up against Oregon yeah. uh, this weekend. So first time I think in, I don't know how long, where they're both three and oh, heading into a matchup. So uh, Oregon's ranked 10. I think I saw well, Colorado actually dropped from 18 to 19 in the rankings, which is weird, yeah. but whatever. So, but again, I mean, he was unranked and beat 17 TCU. So, I mean, you know, it's not unfathomable for him to go from a 19 and beat a, 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 a number 10 rank. I mean, it's not impossible at all. I, honestly, you know, to me, I think the odds are more in their favor because people are actually going to be doubting them. And Dion and the Colorado Buffalo do really well when they're getting, uh, when they have a lot of doubters. Yeah, 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 yeah. Let's, um, yeah, and, and with, and when it comes to the mentorship stuff, I, I know you talked about your father being a big influence on you. What, what mentors did you have growing up or did, did you have any going to the NFL and did you get any, have any coming out of the NFL? You know, great question. So I had my strength coach, Keith Camaforo, who worked at uh, some big colleges and we got him my last year. He was a great mentor for me. Uh, after the NFL, I really didn't have a lot of mentorship or guidance because there really wasn't anything set up at that time. Now, mm -hmm. after I lost my construction company and went out of business all by my own mistake, all by my own omissions and errors, I ended up getting mentored by um, Roman Oben, who has been a family friend, but I hadn't seen him in a while. And then also Andre Collins, who played at Penn State, played for the Washington, now Commanders and Chicago Bears. And Andre was the one that told me about the Gene Upshaw Trust Fund program, which allowed me to get some sovereignty, and allowed me to have time to get myself together after I filed that Chapter 7 bankruptcy. Well, I started the process anyway in April of 2013. So then Andre helped me. And actually, Andre was the one that encouraged me to go to the NAPSA program, National Athletic Professional Success Academy. And that program changed my life. It got me to be much more business savvy. It got me to learn how to use my football knowledge in business. It got me to understand how to be much more of a better speaker, a mm. better coach, a better consultant. So then Brad Mitchell, who was actually running that program, Brad is my coach and mentor today. So I have a question about speaking or how to charge a price or something like that. I go straight to Brad and I get the answers that I need right away. Man, that's so that's so important too. I, I'm I'm glad you brought all of that up because the idea of community is just so so powerful with with regard to you know when we're when when we're at a bottom we we know we we realize who's there for us and you know it sounds like you had that team there for you when you hit that you know when you hit your bottom when you had to go through bankruptcy. And would you mind kind of touching on that too? Like, I know you had you built a construction career right after you left college. It 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 seemed to go really well for a while, but then, um, but then it it you had to file bankruptcy. Can you can you touch on that a bit? Yeah, I I I, um, I formed the construction company after my NFL career, not my college career. Oh, I'm sorry. I bet, yeah, that's, I apologize. My <laughs> but no, sorry. I ended, I ended up starting a construction company in downtown Baltimore. It was a site work. Let me go back. It was a small concrete company. Mm -hmm. Started doing concrete work, demo, just small, small stuff. I then and my partner and I progressed into larger dirt work jobs, dirt work, sediment erosion control, hauling, grading, stone, trucking, you name it, dumpsters, big demo. And we built the most successful, most earning, I'm sorry, revenue earning construction company minority owned in the site work field in Baltimore City and the state of Maryland for two years. And we own Baltimore as the site work king because my mentor who had taught me about it, he went out of business. And so when he went out of business, a huge void opened up for us to come in mm. and really get into the business. And we did very, very well. But I tell people all the time, 
that if you're not ready to handle success and fulfillment and money, then success, fulfillment, and money will hand you your butt. <laughs> and it handed me my butt in uh, April 2013 when I moved to Raleigh with only $400 to my name after losing wow. my construction company, all the company cars, my personal cars, my personal residence, everything just went <laughs> gone. So I, I had to start over from the bottom to get where I'm at, you know, you know, in that regard. Wow. Yeah. That's said. So when you, and when you say you're not ready to handle success, like if you, if you're not ready to handle success, it'll hand you your butt. What, uh, can you, can you expand on that? You know, as far as. Yeah. yeah. Because here's the thing, right? If you're not humble or appreciative, or if you don't remember who got you to that point, if you don't remember <laughs> what it was that got you to that moment or to that level of fulfillment, success, you know, financial gain, you really are not really paying attention. And that's what happened to me. I didn't really take care of my team. I didn't take care of my people. I didn't take care of people that got me there. You know, I was just very, very, very all about myself. I was all about, you know, the, I call them external motivating factors, mm -hmm. things like money, fame, notoriety, you know, women, nightlife, drinking, gang, I mean, like all the things that meant absolutely zero, I was all about it. Yeah. And because I became all about things that didn't matter, it built in me this toxicity. And that toxicity came into my organization. As a result of that, I didn't listen. I created a competitive thing of like jealousy, envy, mm -hmm. rage, wrath. We call those the personality ethics, right? You have the character ethics things like loyalty, truth, justice, honor. Then you have what's called the personality ethics, rage, wrath, you know, all these things, right? And so like, for example, right, you know, today, you know, I got into an argument with my girlfriend and some things came across and I realized now that I was wrong because I, I, I'm divorced. I got divorced last year. I started the process last year. <laughs> and, you know, it's hard because it was not expected. But I bring this up because I'm now living on the character ethics side. So I made an assumption on something that was wrong and I was wrong. And I had to tell you, you know what? I was wrong. You know what I mean? I, I'm sorry. I just, yeah, I was impatient. And it's a, it's a sensitive topic, but... I was just impatient and I was wrong. Mm -hmm. The old Marcus, not maybe maybe like three or four years ago, would have said, "Well, why didn't you do this?" And it would have just stood my ground, living on the on the personalities ethics side, like you know, rage, wrath, envy, lust. You know, just feeling. Like, well, why didn't you say it? Why you know, saying so now. What I try to do in business and in life is live on the character ethics side. Mm -hmm. Am I going to always be right? No. Like I said, I made an assumption to pay with her that was wrong. But what I try to do, if I make a mistake, own it, fix it, move on. And that's what we do now with our coaching, our podcast. We have an app, the Marcus Ogden app. You can download it on your phone. Uh, I mean, we're, we have it on, you know, we're, we go on a ton of podcasts like yours, Adam. I shoot podcasts. You know, I have a great partnership with Multiformat Network out of Chicago. Uh, we interview some great people, all types of people. But my point is, if you're listening to this, Live on the character ethics side of the street hmm. because if you're living on the personality side. It's just a matter of time before you implode. And trust me, trust me, right? It will cost you. Yeah. Right. It will cost you. Yeah. That's a, uh, I mean, I, I love that idea of the character ethics versus the personality ethics and how those kind of intertwine because that's, that's really helpful. And, and, and that does that, does that play into the idea of our ego? Because I know you oh, have a keynote about that. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yo, personality ethics feed your ego to where it gets bigger than the good part of your soul. I have an acronym for ego, huh. exaggerated, glorified opinions. So like I said, I got divorced last year. I found some things out in, uh, in July of last year. And I was trying to work through them with my ex and we weren't able to do that. And then I moved into an apartment after, you know, we in November. So I had to live in the same house from July to November with the person I was filing a divorce, you know, filing a divorce with. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so it's really, really important, you know, in that regard. And so what happened is when I got into the apartment, I was living on the on the personality ethics side. I hated it. I was very, very upset. 
I was jealous of, you know, the fact she got to stay there, all this type of stuff. I was just like, what the hell? I missed that and the other. And I was just like mad at the world. And that, you know what I'm saying? I was all about me. Like, you know, and I was like, God, like, you know, what's going on here? Right. And so I was just, you know, just stewing my own stuff. So November was tough. Last Christmas holiday was absolutely horrific. Right. You talk about, you know, the, you know, the flow of, of fear, like, you know, the flow over fear. Like I lived in the fear last year. Yeah. I didn't even buy a freaking Christmas tree last December in that apartment because I felt like Freddy Krueger was going to pop out the refrigerator because it was a two-bedroom, fully furnished, dark, dingy apartment. Like, how am I going to be coaching people? How am I going to be doing this? Now, I'm a fraud. I'm a phony. Da, da, da. January, I said, I got my mojo back a little bit. I put money down. Uh, I put money down on a house, right? And so I was like, yes, this is going to be awesome. Da, 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 da. So what happens, right? I find out from my mortgage company, oh, by the way, Marcus, you got to pay this much debt down from this organization because, or it's the IRS, because when you guys were married, there was debt you need to pay down. So you got to pay down all this money or at least half the debt to qualify. So I'm sitting there like, oh my God, I feel I've got about maybe 50 grand left in cash, right? I owe about 44000 to the IRS. I owe money to my divorce attorney. Oh, by the way, I got to put down more money to get into the house, another 20 grand. Oh, by the way, I got to live life and pay my team all that type of stuff, which is about 10 grand a month, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm like, what the hell am I going to do here, man? And so I'm just sitting there, this, and for two days, I'm just like fearful, panicking. Ah! Then I said, okay, then you say flow, right? I said, well, Marcus, let's let some things flow. What do you have? A brand. So I leaned into the brand, to the podcast, to what I was able to do. And I started to do PR for people, create more sponsorships, get more great guests, all these things. Come to find out, since from, from uh, what was that? From uh, January 10th until May 15th, I had to spend $150,000 cash, IRS, divorce attorney, paying my people, living life. I was able to do it. Mm -hmm. I was able to take care of everything. I moved into my house May 15th of this year. My goal when I got into that apartment was moving to a house by November 15th of 2023. I beat that by six months. Nice. Our podcast is in the top 1% in the world, most popular. We're almost in the top half percent, according to Listen Notes. It'll be some great people, iconic people. I'm sitting right now in my home that I bought for me and my daughter. And now I feel flowing with joy. And I'll say one more thing too about fear. When I moved into that apartment, I'll never forget my daughter telling me like the, like the first week she was there. She's like, cause my, cause uh, she thought it was an office. She said, daddy, daddy. I'm like, yes, fair. Your office is really small. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. You know, I don't know uh, what, you know, how we're going to be here, but you know, it's just like your office is really, really small. I don't have a lot of space. I don't know. You know I don't really have a lot of friends, but you know, I just want you to know, you know, I don't know why we're going to be here or you know, short term, but it's just, it's like really small. And let me tell you something. If you're listening, think about, think about having your daughter who you love, who you're having to leave. You had to leave because something that really wasn't planned on. Mm -hmm. And then you have her who's, who's eight saying that to you, mm -hmm. right? Right. How would you feel? The fear just came like, oh my God, like, how am I going to turn this around, right? So if you're listening, what you got to do, the four things that I did, okay? Visualized, vocalized, voted, vicinity, visualized. I knew where I wanted to go. I just didn't know what it was going to take to get there. Mm -hmm. So I knew I wanted a house, but I didn't know what it was going to look like. I didn't know how it was going to be. I, I didn't know any of that stuff. I said, okay, I, I want a house. So that was the visualization, right? So I visualized. So my mind, so in November of last year, my mind was in my new home. My body caught up in May. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's the visualization. Vocalize. You can either tell yourself positive self-talk or negative. Right. You can either do positive, you know, you know what I'm saying, you know, meditation, right? Which is internal, or you can do positive manifestation, which is external. It's that simple. Mm -hmm. It's on you. Right. You have to make the call. Right. So I ended up going that route. Right. Then voting. Right. 
every single day I did something to cast a positive vote. Shot a podcast, went on a podcast, emailed somebody, did this, did that, did this, did that. Voted every single day something positive. And in vicinity, I changed who I was around. Mm. I have two women in my life who are like my sisters. No, I'm one my whole life, one over 25 years, I'm 42. I would talk to them every day, text, call, whatever. People in my group, clients that were really good people that uh, I got out of that toxicity of people I hung around with my ex that wasn't any good for me. And now here I am. So if you're stuck, right, if you're in that fear moment, like I said, just blow over fear. If you're in that fearful moment, visualize, vocalize, vote vicinity. That will get you flowing with positivity to move to where you want to go. And like I said, I'm telling you right now, this is my home that I'm in. This is, I'm in my dining room table. Every room in my house now has furniture. Wow. Am I done? No, I'm only four months in. But I have my dining room table. I've got my couch. I've got, I mean, so every room has something in. And when I lived in that apartment, right, Adam, I didn't own squat. Yeah. I never, ever wanted to work at the apartment. I found every freaking reason to leave that apartment. Wow. Every freaking reason. I go to movies all the time, which I love to do, by the way. Uh, poker all the time, got out, you know, do things in my car, you name it. I was out like a shot because yeah. I just hated my surroundings. So again, those four Bs took me to victory. Those four Bs can take you to victory. Wow. I love I love that. that I'm so glad you mentioned that because you just gave basically a great formula for getting to flow from fear. And, and you've also demonstrated with the vulnerability that you just shared that, that we, you know, that, that, that there's hope beyond that feeling of hopelessness. And I think you've, you've learned that repeatedly throughout your house and, or throughout your life. Um, and with those four V's visualize, vocalize, voting, vicinity, leading to victory. Um, that's, that's a powerful framework. So what, you know, as far as, you know, what, what ingrained that resilience in you, because you know, getting to the NFL, coming out, you know, having to to rebuild a number of different times. What was it that that reinforced that resilience in you? What reinforced that resilience in me is playing in the NFL. You're gonna get beat. Mm -hmm. I don't care how you how good you are, right? T.J. Watt has 81 and a half sacks in five years, which is absolutely crazy to even think about, right? Right. He played with some really good tackles, right? those guys are going to get beat by T.J. Watt, right? My brother, one of the best, if not the best left tackle in National Football League's history, got beat every once in a while by Dwight Freeman, right? Right. So, again, Anthony Munoz. I mean, Lawrence Taylor was the juggernaut of his time. Here comes Anthony Munoz, hands him a few losses, right? The, the NFL taught me how to deal with winning and losing. Mm -hmm. And in life, you're going to win, you're going to lose, right? Like I said, at the end of the day, I mean, it, it, it ain't easy. Life is not linear. It's hard. You know what I mean? I just told my girlfriend, look, you know what? I'm not perfect, right? I'm not going to sit here and tell you that you were everything wrong in the situation. No, I own it. Here we are. Nope. I was the one that assumed it was the same. When you assume you make an ass of yourself, which I did. So, but luckily she loves me enough to want to work through it, just like I love her to want to work through it, right? Mm -hmm. Life is going to be like that. Yeah. I don't care who you are, right? So what football taught me was how to bounce back from fear because at the end of the day everybody fear not most people i know fear death why yeah. it's the unknown it's the unknown right but i get it but here's what i'm thinking about right if i sit here all of my life worrying about death i won't ever live my life mm -hmm. so what are you gonna do yeah what are you gonna do you gotta get going so say if you're listening and you don't have a coach get one because a great coach will make you focus on where you're at, where you want to be and stop worrying about the unknown. Right. Right. I, you know, and, and that was the freaking problem in that apartment. It was the unknown. I had a temporary agreement with my ex, but it wasn't final. So I couldn't, without her signing paperwork, I couldn't buy my home. Without doing that, I didn't really know was it going to be any type of child support or, or any alimony because nothing was finalized. 
So in that apartment, November, December, January, February, right? Right. March, April, and not until early May when she signed off on the paperwork was it ever going to be like, what can I do? I don't know. Like I was literally waiting because I closed my house May 15th. My ex signed the paperwork for me to buy the house. I think it was on like May 6th or 7th. Mm -hmm. I was getting down to the wire and I had to be, you know, I'm always, and again, I don't, I'm not mean to my ex or anything like that, but I had to be super nice. Right. Right. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm cordial now. I mean, I don't, I don't hate or anything like that, but like, you know, I had to be super nice. Yeah. Why? I had to agree to things I didn't want to agree to. Why? Because I need her to sign something. That was the fear in me. So that's why when I lived in that apartment, not only did I hate it where I was, I was in a constant state of fear because I didn't know what the hell was going to happen next. Yeah. When I got out of the unknown and I was able to focus on reality, that's when things got better. Hmm. Well, that, that's when things got better. Yeah, and that unknown is a is it's a powerful force. Just just the idea and, and that fear of the unknown. I mean, I, I always consider that there's really three primary fears that we deal with. Like the unknown is one of them, the fear of the unknown, overwhelm, and self-doubt. And I mean, a lot of that that just plays on itself so that it, it clouds our judgment. It gets us, you know, into this bad state. And so how and, and it sounds like you have that formula to kind of rise above that in a way. You visualize, vocalize, voting, vicinity. Is that really the path to kind of rise above that, continue to move forward? Or is there is there something else we should be doing? No, I mean, that's it. Yeah. You need to be visualizing where you want to go. You need to vocalize to yourself. You are good enough. You have to vote positively every single day. And you have to change who you are around. Mm -hmm. If you don't like who you are around, change it. Right? I mean, I love my friends. Now. I don't. I, it's interesting, like... I don't really have a lot of people over to the house. I mean, my my daughter's here. I mean, I've had friends come over, stuff like that, you know, here or there. Yeah. But like, I have friends, but I don't really have a lot around this area. I just moved here to a small town, but that's okay. Yeah, you know I mean, like, I, if you're in my house, that means you're special. I mean, my daughter's here all the time. My girlfriend comes over a lot. Uh, I've had friends over in the neighborhood who are nice people. I've got to know my neighbors, you know, and I'm the only single person in my development because it's very expensive to live here yeah. now i want you to listen to this too a lot of times in life when things happen you're fearful or you're no you got to count on yourself first mm -hmm. right people aren't gonna help you unless you want to help yourself amen. right amen a lot of people but i'm not going to coach you if you're not going to make the investment to help yourself mm -hmm. right i have you on my podcast telling me your authentic story if you're going to be inauthentic or not vulnerable and you're going to hide stuff, I'm like, nope, you won't work. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. So again, it's like, you know, and again, I'll go back to my girlfriend. It's just so, it's like, it's just, it's just happened today. I'd rather her tell me how she feels now than wait till later on. Right. I learned something today. We can get through tough conversations and, you know, I, I have to, to be a little bit more patient. Right. Right. But I learned that, that now, then say, hey, let's get. I was talking to a guy on my podcast, Robert Owens. You know, he's like, hey, man, you know, I married you. You were amazing. You were awesome. Things were great. Oh, you have a kid who, ha who has special needs, right? Then, we, then you you don't marry that. Oh, I'm drained. I don't know. And then you get divorced, right? Or right. somebody that works a lot. Oh, why are you working all the time? Well, I mean, I got to pay the bills. Well, you weren't like this when we were dating. Well, yeah, because we were dating. Now it's real life, right? So, you know, I'd rather know about somebody now mm -hmm. than later. Yeah. So again, if you're listening, don't be afraid to have the tough conversations, because if you don't have tough conversations and work towards conflict resolvement, then when you get into having conflict later on, if like you're married or you're in business with somebody or you have a partnership, you don't know how to deal with it then, oh man, then it's hard to do what? Dissolve it. It's hard to do what? Move by it. Yeah. Right? So yeah. I learned that myself like i need to learn how to be better more patient and how to actually learn how to communicate with her in a way which will make her feel better and again that's how it is in, i was telling my clients that that's how it is in business that's how it is in life yeah it's the same thing man that's so that's so relatable because i mean the sooner you can be authentic the sooner you can develop those authentic relationships um and that that's powerful and 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 so i 
and and that kind of gets to the idea of what 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 was it that brought you to this place where you want to help people, where you want to speak to people and you want to want to help them become their best? I was tired of living a life of failure and not helping others learn from my failures to avoid catastrophic failure. Yeah. Will I prevent everybody from being from failing? No. Right. Can I prevent every catastrophic failure? No. But I'm going to do the best I can help whomever I can minimize mistakes. That's what it's all about. If I can help you minimize mistakes, then we're on the same pet road to, to success. So I got into this business to help others learn from my failures so they can succeed in their own path, their own journey, their own life. Mm-hmm. Wow. So, and, and you do that through speaking a lot of keynotes, you're speaking with businesses and things like that. Who are your who are the primary people that you're looking for or, or the, that should be looking for you, should I say? Oh, it's, it's, it's I mean, <laughs> people say you should be, you should be more specific, but with my coaching, because I've been through so many things, sports, business, life, mindset, uh, uh, transition, adjustment, speaking, coaching, podcasting. You know, if you want to be a speaker or a coach or a consultant or start a podcast, we're actually about to launch a three month cohort program on how to do branding, get on bigger speaking stages, and how to monetize a podcast. Mm-hmm. I'll tell this to you right now. Without the podcast, the sponsorships, the PR we bought, the house that I'm living in would never be so. Mm-hmm. Wow. Never be so. Podcast sponsorships and PR combined equate to about 60% of our top line revenue this this so far this year. 60. That's incredible. That's that, incredible. And that and so people want to learn how to monetize. We're going to do that in the course. I do that in my one-on-one coaching, right? How to monetize your podcast. So again, anybody that wants to uh, work in those areas can contact us. That's great. Well, I know I know we're running short on time here and I want to be respectful of your your uh, uh, your next appointment and and I, but I also and I also want to share where people can find you. you. You're a coach. You're speaking. You have this amazing uh, podcast, uh, and that's that's doing incredibly well. Uh, how how would you like people to find you and get in touch with you? Great question. They can go to our app, which is M A R Q U E S. Then Ogden O G D E N. You have an Apple phone, Android, Google. Go to your app store. Type my name in. Bam! It'll pop up. You can also go to Marcus. 360.com. That's our link. You can go to our website, testimonials, podcasts, you name it. You can also go to our website, www.marcusogden.com or shoot me an email, marcus at marcusogden.com. That's incredible. And, um, and yeah, the website is so chock full of value. And I was just going through all your videos and everything. You have so much great content on there. I, I mean, I love your authenticity. Your story is incredible. And I really encourage people to reach out, follow at the very least, Mark, as if, if, and if you can, um, and if you can reach out to him for coaching, speaking or anything like that, please do so. Um, and Marcus, it's been a real pleasure. I'm really grateful that you were here with us today to share your value and your story. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me on my friend. I appreciate it. All right. Well, we'll talk to you soon. Thanks for everyone. Hey, thanks everyone for joining and we will see you next time. Hey everyone. Thanks for tuning into the flow over fear podcast. If you'd like to learn more about getting into flow and learn the foundations of flow, I have a free video series on my website at www.adamcliffordhill.com called the foundations of flow. Feel free to go there and download it and start your journey to rising above fear and achieving greater flow in your life. If you like this episode, and I'm guessing you did if you stuck around for this long, then please do me a favor and hit the subscribe button and you will receive notifications when I have new interviews, new recaps, and new trainings that pop up on YouTube. Thanks again for joining us.